Dr. Kim, welcome to In Conversation. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Is a vaccine going to be the magic bullet that the world is waiting for? Well, when we look at the kinds of things that we can do uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic, you know, a vaccine is probably the most cost effective of the solutions. You know, assuming that COVID-19 will be here for several years, and I think that's pretty certain now, uh, and will undergo a series of, of maybe waves or maybe a low, slow burn with occasional outbreaks, uh, I think a vaccine is the, is the one potential inter intervention that will get us back to something similar to what we had before COVID-19 started. Is everything going to change, though, with opening up of borders? But if you can imagine the flu virus, which is a common point of reference because we've all gotten the flu vaccine, um, the flu virus mutates itself 10 times faster than the COVID-19 virus. And that is even much, the flu virus is much, much less mutation than an HIV virus. So, you know, when, in HIV, we're very concerned that new strains are emerging all the time. In fact, in an individual person, if you got infected on, on say, day one, by day 28, you'd have thousands, if not you know, hundreds of thousands of different strains circulating in your body. That's what HIV does. COVID is not like that. There are some changes that apparently occur in individual people while they're infected, but they're not very common. But with COVID, the normal immune system gets rid of the virus 97 to 98% of the time and people survive. So if the vaccine, or rather when the vaccine comes, we should be able to return to some kind of normal life that existed before the pandemic? So again, it will depend a little bit on the, the qualities of the vaccine and, and also a bit on several of the unknown things that, uh, about the virus and, and viral infection in the population. So remember, I mean, in, at Christmas 2019, we had no idea what COVID-19 was. So really, we've learned a tremendous amount in six and a half months, but it's not enough. I mean, the, the same questions will continue to dog us. And when you think about how to develop a vaccine, there are really three steps. And, and they seem simple, but, but they're always complicated. Um, the first is that you have to prove that the vaccine uh, works, that it's safe and prevents infection or disease. The second part is that you have to make it. And the third part is that you have to provide it uh, or use it um, in vaccination programs. And in a sense, you know, what we can accelerate right now uh, and what we're really working hard on is the proof that the vaccine protects and is safe. And, and maybe if everything works as it should, um, you know, by the end of the year, we may have a readout on at least one of the vaccines currently in the pipeline that it you know, may protect or, or may not protect um, populations against COVID-19. The bigger question around safety is, you know, do we actually have enough safety data from, you know, basically a study that was six months long? And, you know, we're, we aren't going to really be able to tell. We will have a good amount, I mean, thousands of um, evaluations of safety over six months. But, you know, often we have years of safety data that have accumulated during the five to 10 year development cycle the normal development cycle for a vaccine. Does that mean, therefore, that when we push out this COVID-19 vaccine, it's going to have, be less safe in that sense than vaccines that have been around for a long time? Because traditionally, if I understand correctly, phase three, when it goes out to be tested on volunteers, human volunteers, not animals, it would need thousands of volunteers. And normally it would take quite a while for you to monitor them, to see how it's going to have an effect, whether it, you know, what their side effects are. But we don't have that time anymore. So I think in the short term, to the point where the vaccine will either be given an emergency use, use authorization or an approval for marketing, uh, we will have less uh, long-term safety information than we normally have. So I think, you know, as vaccine developers, we really need to commit that we will follow the people who received vaccine and placebo for a much longer time than we would normally do, you know, say 12 months, we would commit to following them for two years or three years or longer to make sure that there isn't something, you know, that's going to be there at a very low level that we really should be aware of, um, but that we can't because we're really pushing hard to show that the vaccine uh, works. In five years from now, Will we have COVID-19 completely in control? So I think that um, complete control means different things to different people. Um, if we achieve 70% um, vaccination rates or 60% vaccination rates, you know, you'll see an occasional COVID-19 infection that will look, you know, like someone uh, has a, a fever and maybe some cough or shortness of breath, they'll test them and you'll find COVID. 
but it won't spread in the population because enough people are immune that we've um, protected the population from the consequences of an outbreak. Do you think though that by the end of this year, we could have a vaccine that perhaps my mother or father who are in their 80s could have safely? And my mother and father also, yes. Um, so that's a tough one. I, I think that several of the vaccines that are now um, either entering or are said to be in the third stage, the efficacy stage of testing, um, look potentially um, interesting. They make the right protective responses. They all protect monkeys against infection. So again, you know, um, monkeys are the closest uh, model to what we have in humans. Um, and so there's a lot of suggestive evidence that they might protect for at least a short period of time. Um, we don't really know though. And, you know, we've been fooled before. Um, certainly in HIV, we, we have had times when we believe the monkey model. Uh, but it was not borne out in humans. So again, we have to be very careful when we use animal studies. But from a, when you're looking for a vaccine, you want to make sure that you have the infection-fighting proteins, the neutralizing antibodies, and the killer cells. And, and many of the candidates that have advanced, like the Oxford vaccine or the, the vaccines from China, um, really do look like they generate the right uh, protective responses. Uh, and so now it's you know making sure that we can show that it actually prevents infection in humans, and that's the critical next step. So normally, you know, again, if we were if we go back to the you know the usual situation when we have five to ten years, as a vaccine is undergoing phase three, and if the company is as they usually are, pretty confident the vaccine will will be uh, will show efficacy and be approved, then they are building the capacity to make that vaccine uh, while they're doing the efficacy testing. Why? Because once the vaccine is approved, you want to be able to sell it because all this cost that you racked up during the five to 10 years of development has to be paid back to the company. And, and that's, you know, so you have a year or two to actually build the manufacturing capability or to switch your manufacturing facilities to make the new vaccine. Now imagine that though, that we're doing this all in 12 months. And so what the United States government and, and, and others are, are thinking about now, and actually the United States government, I think, at least from, this, from what Dr. Fauci has said, it seems that they are placing very educated bets on certain vaccines, and they're asking companies to manufacture the vaccines at risk. Other organizations like CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, are trying to quickly they can manufacture, say, 2 billion doses of vaccine. So they're doing things like securing uh, manufacturing facilities, buying glass, which most people say, well, why do you need glass? But Vaccines come in vials, and if there's a shortage of glass for vials, you can't you can't do it. So, it's a part of the planning that companies routinely do as they're beginning to roll out uh, vaccines. But it's very it's compressed into really six months of very intensive work. Are we looking at a one-time vaccine, and then you're safe, so to say, or at least you are immunized forever? Or are we going to be looking at, for want of a better comparison, let's say flu vaccines, where you have to keep getting a new flu shot every year? A little bit depends on the vaccine. So for instance, um, the vaccine that Oxford University has appears to be a single dose vaccine, uh, at least for the protective responses that we want to see early on. But what we don't know is whether that Oxford single dose vaccine will continue to protect in year one, year two, and year three. So you might actually have to give a booster of the same vaccine. 
some of the other vaccines, so for instance, the vaccine, one of the vaccines from China, um, some of them are two dose vaccines. So that means you get one dose and then a month later you get your second dose. And that will give you uh, protective responses for a certain period of time. If a person has been infected with COVID-19, does that person need to have, be immunized? So don't know the answer to that question. And, and so I think there are a number of people who are talking about um, human challenge studies. And, and if you were going to do that, one of the first groups that you might challenge would be people who had already been infected. With the idea being that you really want to know that those immune responses protect. Which part of the immune response protects? Is it the infection fighting proteins or the killer cells? And you can do that in a controlled challenge model. And then you would wait and you, you test people and, or challenge people who are then, you know, six months or 12 months away from their original infection to see if there's a certain amount of, of remaining uh, protective response, what we call immunological memory that is sufficient to protect them against uh, challenge. And so that would be the first step. The, the next step that you could imagine would be, um, you know, you take people who are volunteers, again, uh, who would be willingly exposed to the virus. So you'd vaccinate them and then expose them to virus and then see if they develop an infection. Keeping them hospitalized, providing them with, you know, whatever care they needed, free of charge. Um, but again, they'd have to be volunteers. And Actually, a group in the United States has signed up 10,000 people who, uh, who are never had COVID infection, who've been will, who are willing to volunteer in these studies um, because they, they recognize the, the risk that COVID puts all of us at. How much do you think all of this has become political, though, where the knowledge being shared has become politicized, where, you know, groupings will say that, oh, OK, perhaps that um, researchers in America won't trust what's coming out of China and vice versa? I think that one of the important parts of medical and scientific research is that a lot of results are confirmed. I mean, we don't trust the first uh, publication. It's very important to make sure that what was published is correct. So it may not be the exact same trial, um, but it will be in a different population, in a different uh, area. But if it, if it becomes a question of trust, whether or not you thought that the researcher really did carry out those tests and did not fabricate the results, I mean, that undermines everything, doesn't it? And, and that's a great point. And so, you know, a lot of the organizations that are doing this kind of funding have um, a series of laboratories that are designated to receive samples so that uh, there can be some standardization of the assay. So, you know, one of the problems for other vaccines is you know, you company A does its test and it, and it runs its own analysis and company B does its test and it runs its own analysis. But how do we compare the two? One of the important things around uh, organizations like CEPI or the United States government that are funding large efforts may be that they need to standardize those assays so that they can compare vaccine A to vaccine B to vaccine C because while a lot of them, or maybe two or three of them, or maybe more, will be shown to be safe and effective in the first pass, how long will that last? in developing countries be able to afford to have the vaccines? So there is a, a tremendous effort uh, going on now, and, and I hope that it succeeds. Um, it's called COVAX, and it's um, CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, the World Health Organization, and Gavi. Gavi, the, the Vaccine Alliance, is that organization that um, provides vaccines at low or no cost to um, countries under a certain um, minimal income uh, per person. And they're planning uh, and they're trying to get countries to sign letters of interest in order to get those vaccines uh, committed so that Gavi can make a bulk purchase a vaccine at a reasonable cost. The other thing that, that works in the favor of countries um, in Asia, South, Southeast Asia, um, is the idea that when, they, when 
companies accept funding from CEPI. They also commit to being able to provide that vaccine for global health at a reasonable cost. The, the question is, what's the reasonable cost? And you know, there are examples of vaccines that are really beneficial um, that have had difficulty, or we've seen difficulty in getting them out to what we call middle-income countries, because Gavi takes care of the poorest countries. The countries, for instance, Thailand or Vietnam, um, with middle incomes that are no longer Gavi eligible, often have a problem getting um, some of the best vaccines uh, in because they're just too expensive. So what's the solution for that? So we're going to have to depend on Gavi and, and CEPI, and then individual countries' negotiations with companies in order to ensure that the reasonable price falls within the price range that middle-income countries can afford. Isn't it also a question of the companies who are developing the vaccines being willing to accept that they may not make such a whopping profit? Again, I, I, I can't speak for the companies. Um, I think that several of the companies have made um, statements around the idea that there's um, no profit. Um, but also, I think that you know one of the reasons that we're charged a lot for vaccines is that companies uh, undertake a si significant amount of risk. If you think about the five to 10 year development cycle, for a company that reflects between 500 million and 1.5 billion US dollars worth of investment. But what is the US government or the Chinese government or CEPI doing by giving companies $488 million? They're helping the company to de-risk the project. So you know, a company is spending $1.5 billion, it has a 93% chance of failure. So there's a huge amount of risk. What the governments are doing is they're saying, well, here's the funding, make us a vaccine. And they're de-risking it. So some of the additional costs are covered. So hopefully that will enable the companies to offer the vaccine at a lower cost. And I think that would probably be a bargaining position among governments um, that are funding this effort, governments that are funding CEPI, um, and organizations. But doesn't this move also into a political point where, you know, each country may want to get the vaccine quicker for their own population and, and therefore self-interest then precedes a more broad interest that we would want to help our neighbors? So it's difficult to anticipate what governments will do because all governments um, are responsible for the people who live in the country. Um, so on the one hand, and it's very important that they support the international effort, um, on the other hand, they will try to map out positions for themselves if they can um, that will guarantee that they will get maybe a certain percentage of their need uh, first. And it may not be that much. I mean, who are the people at greatest need? It may be the elderly, healthcare workers, or people with underlying conditions that make them more vulnerable to severe disease or death. And, and so maybe that's 20% of the population. So you don't need all of the vaccine all at once. You may want to just vaccinate the most vulnerable people first. But even those are rather large numbers, aren't they? I mean, if we look, just look at the number of people in the world who are over 60 or 65 years old, I mean, that's, in, that's what, about 800, 900 million persons globally? Maybe more. That's um, a lot of vaccines. And, and so, yes. Um, and if we think that we need 60% um, or 70% of people vaccinated in order to achieve this magic, herd immunity, um, and we have 8 billion people in the world, I mean, the math is, is pretty astounding. Um, so, you know, maybe vaccinating on the order of 4 billion to 6 billion people, and if there are two doses, that's 8 billion to 12 billion doses of vaccine. That's a huge number. Is that realistic? Is that realistic for us to get that number out and even then reach people to be vaccinated over the next 12 months, let's say? Over the next 12 months, it would be a stretch. Um, CEPI has identified, I think, roughly 10 billion uh, dose manufacturing, uh, the capacity to manufacture about 10 billion doses during a surge. Um, how or whether we'll be able to utilize all that and will it, whether it will, can be used to make the specific vaccines that are shown to work is a separate question. But there is some man manufacturing capacity out there and the real question will be, you know, how quickly can we mobilize it? And I think countries and companies are already um, making contracts with different organizations, uh, manufacturers, to be able to ensure that the vaccine is made. Um, and, you know, we don't know. We've never undertaken something like this before. What about anti-vaxxers, people who are against taking a vaccine? We know that 
you know, when we test them properly and use them properly, the vaccines are safe. When you look at for every dollar you spend on a vaccine, you save $16 in healthcare costs. That, those are just direct benefits. If you look at the total societal benefit of vaccines, for every dollar you spend, you, you save $44. What kind of investment gives you a return of 44 to one? I mean, very few. You know, you prevent measles and, um, or death from measles or severe complications of measles on the one hand, but at the same time, children have better cognitive development, physical development, they achieve more in school, Families are kept out of poverty. I mean, there's data from uh, Global Alliance for Vaccines that, that there's better economic growth in countries with good vaccination programs. The benefits of vaccination are, are really enormous, and we really need to talk to people about both the direct and indirect benefits of vaccination and build on the trust that's already there. Dr. Kim, thank you very much for being on In Conversation. It's my pleasure, thank you.